Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 23rd Oshkosh Common Council meeting. Will we please call the order, call the meeting to order and call the roll? Cashel? Here. Ford? Here. Alice Massey? Here. Kelsey? Looks like we lost uh, deputy mayor for the moment. Um, Uber hour. Here. Erickson. Here. Paul Mary. Here. Present six at the moment. Yes, and looks like he's back with us now. Prosy. Unmute, please. I'm here. Sorry. Okay. Thank Present you. Seven. All right, Council Member Paschal will lead us in the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. We ask for guidance tonight as we begin this meeting. May all those who participate in our discussions and our decisions reflect the values we cherish in our great city. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, to the Republic. Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, justice, for, justice all. for all. All right, good evening. So uh, we do have citizen statements this evening. Citizen statements to council are limited to five minutes um, and must address items that are not listed on the council meeting agenda are limited to issues that have impact on the city of Oshkosh and the common council may address at a future meeting must not include endorsements of any candidates or other electioneering. Uh, Pam, do we have anyone registered for citizen statements this evening? No, we do not. Okay. And public comment are there. I believe we have someone registered for public comment on 1 of the agenda items. We have several individuals registered um, for item number 17 resolution 21 100. We have a Jamie O'Brien. Is she on? I don't see her. I do not see her in my <laughs> list of participants. Okay, then also for item number 17 resolution 21. 100, we have Betsy Quindy, 1115 Jefferson Street, and I do see Betsy. All right, welcome, Betsy. And you can unmute. Okay. There you go. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, Betsy Quindy, 1115 Jefferson. Um, talking regarding the TLP ordinance that you have a draft of uh, this evening. Um, I watched uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting uh, last week regarding this ordinance and they had some questions, um, but passed it anyway. Um, there were some questions regarding the number of persons that could be in the TLP versus a housing, um, a rooming house. Uh, the current ordinance says a rooming house can have eight um, or, or can have six and they're allowing eight for the TLP. Um, I would think that you would want to remain consistent. Uh, the TLP is different than a rooming house. There are services being provided. Um, it, it just seems like that that is something that needs to be looked at. Also, I had a question regarding uh, um, the possibility of a buffer zone around things uh, like the university, schools, parks, uh, pools, that kind of thing. Um, and the the zones illustrated were only on the north side. <laughs> um, it, for for uh, equity purposes and to make it so that uh, the possibility of these TLPs is not concentrated in one area. I was wondering if uh, there would be more, uh, if there are other areas of the west side and south side that could be included in this also, 
um, as an illustration of places, possibilities where TLPs can be placed. Um, I don't, I, I'm not saying not in my backyard. I really am not. Um, I feel that the TLPs can be a fantastic stepping stone if they're managed and um, placed properly. Um, I, there is a need for this type of uh, facility in, t in places for people to transition back into the community out of corrections, um, but they need to be placed properly um, so that they are set up for success and not um, hindering the, an existing neighborhood or school or something because of proximity. Um, I was hoping that uh, because there was questions uh, posed by people in PNZ that they could go back and uh, look at this again because they had also said they didn't see some of the background information regarding the TLPs. So um, I would urge you that if there are questions, even though they did approve it for you tonight, that you would uh, send that back to them and allow them to address their actual questions that they had. That's all I have. Well, thank you, Betsy. Uh, thanks for bringing those questions and certainly council. Uh, this is the first reading tonight and it's actually addressing a uh, transitional residential housing uh, zoning and not specifically TLPs as I understand it. But thank you for pointing out those questions uh, for council to consider. And thank um, you I have one more. I have one more comment. I do appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing on this. I don't want to uh, want you to feel like I'm nitpicking on this, but it was just some cursory things that uh, st stuck out to me. Um, I, I, we as a neighborhood appreciate all that you have done in this regard. Thank you again, Betsy. And I do see that Jamie has joined us and Jamie was registered to speak. Uh, Jamie, would you like to go ahead with your comments now? Sure, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the hard work everybody put into this. It's been a long road for, for many of us. Um, I apologize a minute late. Uh, Mayor Palmer, could you repeat what you would just say about this specifically? This ordinance? So, so this is the time that citizens can make their comments and the ordinance that we're addressing later um, is, is referencing, and it's 21-100, it's a first reading uh, regarding transitional residential housing. Right, so that would be the transitional living that is contracted by the Department of Corrections, replacements in Oshkosh. So if you'd like to go ahead and share your comments, Jamie, um, I'm. I can't really right. go into that because we're not at that place yet in the agenda. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little bit awkward and, and out of order. Um, but okay. yeah, we'll be discussing transitional residential housing. Okay, so um, I guess what we were looking to have included um, and hopefully put into that ordinance would be a buffer zone regarding schools and parks um, just because of in our experience, uh, what we've experienced over the last 10 years, I think that a buffer zone uh, between schools and parks would be appropriate. And there are also other cities that do have buffers around um, the living uh, for schools and parks like that. So that would be the first one. And while looking over the map for the proposed um, zone in Oshkosh, um, some of those zones, while most of them are, are appropriate, there are some that are butted up right next to schools, parks. Um, I do have concerns with some of them. Some of the areas are right on campus. It's right on the, the corner where there's sororities and fraternities. And I think we've all um, living in Ashgash, we know that there's a large number of students who come from out of state who would be aware. And these houses are not, um, there, there really isn't a notification sent out. So people don't know where they I am worried about students who would be coming from out of state, not knowing uh, what they're moving next to. I would be worried about the kids who are walking through 
after you know attending activities on campus at night alone um, through these neighborhoods, as well as the small children who would be walking past, and we will have the middle school students walking, elementary school students to they would be walking alone to their respective schools. Um, so that's a question I have that I, I hope is really taken into consideration. And also the number of residents. So there was talk of eight still being because that's what's on par with rooming houses, but there are no licenses required for uh, these places. So the defensible, you know, there was talk about it not being defensible. Um, or why we wouldn't be able to have six persons instead of eight is because six would be on par with what our current ordinance is and not the eight. Um, did I lose everybody? No, you're, you're good. Oh. We have a, a, about another minute left if you'd like. So, and um, Mr. Mitchell, so it sounded like um, during the planning and zoning, Mr. Mitchell um, posed some questions wondering if there were committees that were working on this and there actually are. It's in Wisconsin State Statute 301.095. There is a council on offender re-entry that they're supposed to be working with and informing the community. Um, in all of our, our experience, we have not found that committee. Nobody, you know, we, we haven't been able to, um, to find that. So if, if somebody could come up with that, that would be fantastic. And I think that would be useful to planning and zoning as well. Um, and the last thing that I was looking over is that the central mixed use, uh, the CMU zone, it looks very large. Is that the largest um, zone? And that runs right down the middle of Oshkosh. So is there going to be some sort of conditional use, um, like identification, how, how would, the central use work. Um, it's not doesn't look very dispersed um, according to the map that was laid out. If anybody could explain or has any ideas on that. Well, thanks for bringing those items up. And, and as I said, when we get to um, the resolution 21-100, uh, we'll, we'll take those into consideration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pam, do we have anyone else registered uh, for public uh, comment on agenda items? Yes, for item number 20, which is 21-103, I have a Christine Witte registered, but I don't see her. Christine, are you here with us? I'm not seeing her in our list of participants either. Um, if council would oblige, if she does come in a little bit later, uh, perhaps we can um, make a be a little flexible here. Okay, that's all that I have signed up to register, and then if we have the emails. Yes. Yeah. So I have a list of six emails uh, that came through uh, to be registered um, in the record, um, all regarding the mask ordinance resolution. Um, Andrew Levitt at UW Oshkosh. Yes, supports the mask ordinance. Um, Greg Haynes, Harnes, 4781 Breezewood. I think that's a Nina address. Um, votes no. Um, Gretchen Shelder, no address, also no. And Jean Kwiatkowski of Oshkosh, yes. Patricia Hallquist of Oshkosh, 2030 Hazel, yes. And Sarah Simon, it just says Winnebago County, no. And, and that's all I have from, I think we all received those in our orange folder this evening, along with the other um, emails that came into Auk Council. Did I get all of those, Pam? Yes, you did. All right, very good. Uh, next, we'll move into consent agenda. We'll need a motion and a second. So moved. Forward. Second. Forward. And Mugerauer. Thank you. Discussion on consent. Uh, 
All right. Uh, I guess maybe uh, there may be a question. Or uh, is Mr. Mauer available reference resolution 2195? Mr. Mauer is here. Get my video. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Mr. Mauer. Um, do you want to just uh, give kind of a brief overview of that that uh, 2195 with the cooperative agreement with the school district on Pollock Park? Sure. This is a uh, an agreement that the city has had with the recreation department, which is through the school district, since the Pollock Water Park was constructed and operating since 2006. Um, it's an agreement that provides for the lifeguards staff uh, to be provided from the recreation department and the city um, does pay for all the costs associated with those lifeguards. And we also in, inside the agreement have um, permission to utilize the Oshkosh West parking lot for use of the pool, except for when there's um, potentially events going on at the auditorium. So this is a, um, it's a consistent agreement we've had. You'll notice that this is just a one year agreement. And the reason we are recommending that is because of COVID um, with the new recreation director and, and our staff in discussions, not knowing exactly how the season will go. Uh, we felt a little more comfortable recommending one year at this point um, for that purpose. All right, thank you. And uh, do we do we have any sense of uh, the expected opening this year given some of the circumstances um what we're planning for right now is opening on june 12th and um, that's all contingent upon us making sure that we have enough staffing um, after being closed for the one summer um, the issue becomes that returning staff that we're counting on may have gotten jobs elsewhere um, but in working with again the recreation department um, they are offering lifeguard training classes and if people are interested, please send them to the uh, the recreation department website. Um, we are looking for staff for the summer, but we're fairly confident that um, that we should have enough staffing. So June twelfth is the targeted date. All right, thank you, uh, Councilmember Mugerauer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Actually, Mr. Mauer, stay stay on. Uh, keep that video on. I uh, one follow up question for you. Um, you know, one of the one of the deciding factors last year was uh, a lack of staff uh, availability. We couldn't train enough lifeguards because the schools are closed. And through our agreement, we used the school district facilities to to do all those certifications and trainings. Um, just confirmation on on at the moment. Obviously, things can change. You know, very very fast. But we're confident that we'll have access to school facilities and that those training programs and certifications will be able to occur in a timely enough fashion to get enough staff in there to reasonably open, hopefully at that, that June 12th or shortly around there? Yes, um, again, it's it's uh, Veronica Robinson from the Recreation Department and her staff offer the lifeguard training programs. Uh, they currently do have access to the school pools and are, again, looking for staff members. So if, again, anybody in the public or if you're aware of anybody, please feel free to send them to the Recreation Department website. And um, that's our hope and our, we're feeling pretty confident that we should have the staffing levels. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Sure. All right. Thank you. Other council members questions on consent items. Seeing none, let's call the roll. Cashel. Aye. Ford. Aye. Allison Massey. Aye. Kelsey. Aye. 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 Erickson. Aye. O'Mary. Aye. Seven. All right, very good then. Uh, our next item is a pending ordinance 21 dash 99 uh, for amending the ordinances pertaining to noise restrictions. Do we have a motion and a second? So move. Second. Second. Heschel and Erickson. All right, then discussion on 2199. I did receive an email. I don't know if all of council received it uh, requesting that we consider a change to the exemption for snowblowers. Um, the specific request came 
And I want to say it was regarding commercial snow blowing operations with um, multiple snow blowers and a request for reconsideration of the time frame, or in the alternative, having no exemption. And um, I guess that's maybe a, a little bit of a discussion in terms of because we we require the snow to be removed 24 hours within 24 hours after the last snowfall. You know, it could be considered that that's closing the window for folks to be able to get that done. Um, is Mr. Rabbi available? I am here, Madam Mayor. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, I guess with regard to is is that accurate? It's twenty four. The snow has to be cleared within twenty four hours after the last snowfall. Yes, the uh, ordinance requires snow to be removed from the public sidewalks within twenty four hours of the snow stopping. All right, Council Member Mugerauer. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I happen to have a, a brief exchange with that same individual uh, who, who expressed that concern. Um, went back and forth via email a little bit and, and in the end, I think he saw that it created some unintended consequences and some, some equity issues or some. Some issues that maybe just weren't weren't readily uh, readily apparent at the beginning. And so I guess as a, I use an example for him and, and I guess I'll use it here. Um, in regards to doing that to differentiating between those 2 types of entities or 2 types of of. Of people, um, you know, myself, I can go out and use a snowblower. I can remove the snow because I have the ability, but maybe my uh, my neighbor, who for whatever reason may not have those same abilities, and has to hire someone or chooses to hire someone to remove those remove that snow and ice, um, they don't have control over when when those individuals show up. And so now I can use it, but they can't, and we're right next to each other, and there's no reason for that. I think it, it created some the the suggestion created some unintended. Uh, consequences and I was glad that we had that conversation, but uh, not sure that that would be the, the right thing to do in, in terms of this. I agree. I agree. Certainly. Not everybody is able to get out there and do that. Other council members discussion on the noise ordinance. Uh, amendment. All right, seeing none, can we please call the roll? Patrick. Bye. Ward? Aye. Allison Matthew? Aye. Rousey? Aye. Mugenor? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Carried seven. All right, we have uh, se several new ordinances here uh, this evening. Uh, no action will be taken tonight. Um, actually, we have four. And the first one being ordinance 21 100 amend various sections of chapter 30 zoning ordinance to add transitional residential housing plan commission recommends approval. Is there further discussion and perhaps um, maybe Mr. Lyons or Mr. Davis would like to speak to this um, uh, what's entailed with this change to the zoning ordinance. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Paul Mary. The Planning Commission uh, did have this discussion last week, and we did have maps uh, for this uh, proposed ordinance. And I believe Mr. Lyons can pull those out up to show everybody where the districts would be located. Uh, and it isn't just on the north side. There was one map showing the north side, but we had a west side and a south side. Just so everybody could get a sense for where those districts could could be located. And 1 of those, I remember 1 of them asking if it was a large area. And I'm not exactly sure which 1 that would be. Uh, I believe uh, Ms. O'Brien referenced the CMU, a large zoning um, section. And, and so, you know, it may take some show and tell here, some pictures and some verbiage to kind of sort that out. And I think there was a reference to a question about the number of folks um, per unit and also, um, yeah, the, the specific on the CMU. Yes, and uh, the short answer on the number of 
uh, residence is based on building code and we want it to be consistent with the building code. And uh, maybe Mr. Lyons can pull up the maps and even follow up on the building code portion of the question. I don't. Yeah, I'll uh, thank you, Mayor. I can try to address some of the questions that, that were raised. Um, we did get them last week, so so I've got uh, some answers for you on some of them. Uh, some of the answers are best practices, custom legal requirements, um, and then I can show the maps if, if Tony, if you can kind of give me um, co-host, I can show the maps that we showed a plan commission as well. I've transferred um, so the role don't... to presenter to you, Mark. All right, let's. We'll start with the maps. We'll give this a go. Now it is going to be three separate maps, just based on when we were mapping this. Obviously, trying to have a scale where um, you can see the entire city doesn't really work. So we broke it down into a, a north section, center section, southern section. Uh, so hope can council can you see my screen? We can see the screen. I will tell you all I see is pink with little black lines because it is super tiny. So okay. if you can be as descriptive as possible, that'd be helpful. Let me zoom in a little bit and I'll kind of move around um, some of the city. Basically, the ones that are colored, the non yellow, the yellow is everything else in the city. Those things that are colored in pink, blue and oranges are the districts we're proposing for the conditional use permit. Um, so we'll start, uh, we'll start maybe with the northern side of the city. Hopefully everyone can see this and I'll, I'll just scroll a little bit. Hopefully you guys can see it. Um, so this, this mainly shows where we have multi-family zoning on the, on the northern portion of the city. Um, and then obviously as you head south, you can see kind of the, again, the colored parcels and I can distribute these to council afterwards as well to help. Um, are the zoning districts where this would be a conditional use permit. Again, we are only proposing this as a condition of use permit at nowhere would it be a by right use. So anyone who proposed this use in these districts would have to go through plan commission and council to be approved. Um, and that's important when we talk about zoning, because um, I fully understand um, some of the residents questions about, you know, in the university area, we have some of this zoning. Same as we do other places in the city. That's where when we talk about zoning, we have to really depend on the conditional use. We can't regulate out individual parcels within a common zoning district through the zoning ordinance. We need to use the conditional use permit for that. So then we'll move on to the center of the city. Uh, so this is where Mr. O'Brien, I think, referenced the purple. That is our CMU zoning area in the downtown. Um, that would be one of the options available. Um, and obviously on the western side of the city, you can see some of those oranges and blues. Again, other zoning uh, districts that allow these. And then kind of the southern segment of the city, um, you can see where some of those zoning districts exist as well. Uh, so it is dispersed through the entire city. Um, it's about 1,865 lots within the city meet those zoning districts. Uh, so we're looking at about 1,800 I said, lots that a conditional use permit would be uh, available. Um, Mark, and I ask a question. Mark, would you mind if I just ask one one question? Because I just want yep. a clarity on the CUP, the conditional use permit process. Because you didn't happen to show the slide very well, but I think there was an area that, for example, showed uh, right by Lakeshore Park and Rainbow Park that has a significant amount of color. In fact, I think the whole area between the two parks, um, right across the bridge, Nashkashia Bridge there. So, for yep. example. You know, one of the, the things that I think Ms. O'Brien um, and the other uh, uh, Betsy had brought up, and they're reasonable points, but, you know, these types of locations in relation to um, areas that where, where children and, and vulnerable populations congregate, um, while you suggest that we'd have to use the CUP process, how, how likely are we actually to use the CUP process to actually deny something then in that. And so we've got to use the process, but what's the likely outcome of us actually denying something in that? Yep. So so here's kind of what I can give for an answer and Lynn maybe uh, attorney Lawrence may be able to chime in as well. 
when we're going to segregate out something, we need to use under, under the state statute empirical data, data showing why putting it in this location would not be an acceptable uh, uh, and a reasonable request to put in that area. So far, when it comes to transitional housing, and I'm going to say transitional housing, not sex offender housing, there is at least that we've been able to find no empirical data that shows why you should not put it somewhere. So when okay. we look at the zoning code, we use that 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 litmus test of is there empirical data that says where you should or should not do this. And at this point, we haven't been able to find anything that we can concretely say, here's the empirical data, here's the, the uh, studies that have been done that said you shouldn't do this here, which is why we don't propose that within our, our recommendation. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, the question about the six verse eight staff gave that a lot of consideration. We were originally looking at six for our proposed ordinance. Um, researching a little farther and discussion with our inspections division. Um, the building code triggers differences at 8 individuals. Um, and, and reviewing it and talking it through it, it is was just our opinion that aligning it with the building code gave us the most solid ground from a legal perspective standing on of why we chose the number again looking for empirical reasons of why we chose a number we chose to align it with that building code requirement to give us that solid foundation of why we said because we know it at more than eight people building code changes um mayor is there any of the questions i missed that i could maybe address as well i, I think i covered them I I guess I just um, want to make sure that it's clear. So in the drafted um, resolution in section 10, it, it says that it's amending to include transitional residential housing with more than eight persons. So can you just explain if it were transitional residential housing with less than eight persons would that be considered a rooming house or just regular residential i know we're excluding single family um single and two family zoning which you know has some other questions but i just want to understand what is the proposal if it's less than eight people for transitional yep. living Correct. So if you got to look at that definition uh, uh, kind of closely, what we're proposing is the one through eight in these zoning districts. Under the definition, the way we've written it, more than eight individuals we are constituting as um, institutional residential, which is a, a zoning use we already have in the ordinance. So this proposal that we're showing you here today with, with the multifamily zoning districts, the CMU, the NMU, and the uh, institutional is where we're proposing the conditional use permit be located. So one through eight would be a CUP in those districts. More than eight, it would fall into our uh, institutional residential land use, which is already something that resides within the zoning ordinance. And then would you just read the final version of the definition of transitional residential housing definitely so transitional residential housing um, and and a little background on the definition um, we did some research on on these type of uses trying to find something that worked uh, this definition came from reviewing some of the uh, hud definitions as well as best practice that we could find elsewhere for transitional residential housing so our definition reads a premise other than community living arrangements or community-based residential facilities that provide housing and appropriate supportive services for the temporary placement of persons on parole, extended supervision, or probation in a controlled environment, including supervision or monitoring to help participants transition to self-sufficient living arrangements. The housing is short-term, typically less than 24 months. A transitional housing premise with more than eight persons shall be considered and subject to the requirements of the institutional residential use as defined under this code. And then I guess just one other clarification. 
So in the conditional use permitting process, are folks who have concerns about this able to ask for, um, I guess, detailed management of the um, supportive services? Or is that a private issue that is between those residents and the, um, I guess, the, the management company or DOC? Yeah, so the, the zoning requires or allows us to have reasonable conditions be placed on the property that are related to land use. Um, there's a little bit of a distinction when you talk about are they reasonable conditions as it relates to land use versus operations. Um, when we do conditions through a conditional use permit, they need to be related to the land use, not necessarily the operational side of things. So that I mean, would be the rational nexus, correct? I guess when you can you maybe give me a little more detail of what so, you're so the advancing of a legitimate government interest, the rational nexus of what that condition is in relation to that specific land use. Correct. They have to be supportable, data driven things that we can basically quantify when we do the condition. All right, thank you. Do other council members have more questions regarding this? We are not again not taking action. There will be a second reading. Um, do other council members and and I can't see your hands because the screen is I will obscured. I will stop sharing. All right. Uh council member Ford. Yes, uh, thank you. So I most of my most of the things I was gonna say were already um were already Answered. I just wanted to um, to clarify. This was uh, brought up at plan commission, and there was a, a discussion that was about the term transitional housing, and people were concerned about it. And as as uh, Director Lyons um, or as Mark Lyons pointed out, um, that comes from HUD, and it's also the language used by the Department of Corrections. So that is very deliberate language, and it's not meant to it's meant to reference something very specific, um, which is why that language was included. Um, and I just want to remind too for the uh, the audience that this is the first reading, so we will be, as you said, Mayor Paul Mary, we'll be actually voting on this at our next meeting. Thank you. Other council members, questions? All right, so we will now move on to um, ordinance 21 101. Again, no action on this item, designate the intersection of Nevada Avenue and Grove Street as a two-way stop. Are there any questions or discussion on that item? Um, perhaps, Mr. Robbie, um, do we just need a quick uh, a brief explanation of why we need that to be a two-way stop? Uh, that would be Mr. Collins, actually. Oh, yes, uh, I did not see him here, thank you. Yeah, I can... Um... Just give me a quick, basically, there's been a little bit of a crash history at that intersection. So, um, by converting that yield to a stop sign, that should help us reduce the number of crashes there. All right, thank you. And our next new ordinance is 21 102 create ordinance to regulate ambulance and medical transport services. Um, let's see here is uh, Chief Stanley or. Uh, Ms. Lawrenson here to speak. Well, I see City Attorney Lawrenson and I also see Chief Stanley. Um, perhaps a brief explanation of that ordinance, proposed ordinance. I'll jump in first and the Chief can add on to that. Um, the ordinance would do two basic things. It would designate the Oshkosh Fire Department as the um, emergency responder for medical services um, and uh, keep all of those the emergency services under the Oshkosh Fire Department who are highly trained. Um, they have uh, the ability to respond in a timely fashion. Um, they also have all the equipment and the skills and necessary um, 
training for that. The other thing it would do then is create a uh, list or registration so that um, for non-emergency response, we would have basically a list showing us who is, is in our community, operating in the community, and a contact person for that so that if there are issues or if we would need um, some additional uh, mutual aid or something, we would have contact information for those people. Um, Chief, do you wanna jump in and add on to that? Sure, thank you. Yeah, as uh, Attorney Lawrenson indicated, you know, this is a provision that allows us to ensure that our community members get the highest level of emergency medical services available, and that's uh, via the Oshkosh Fire Department. That uh, additionally, you know, we made the decision to discontinue the uh, non-emergency and medical transports. You know, so that void is going to need to be filled, and we we knew that going into it, but we want to make sure that you know whoever is going to step forward to fill that void still maintains an expected level of care and meets all the, the licensing requirements and you know, that we're aware of, of who's operating in the city as well. So this uh, does uh, ensure good quality care for both emergency medical services and non-emergency medical services. I did have a question and I apologize. I meant to call ahead with this question. Um, just curious, in these situations where you have the registry of the non-emergency, and I think our ordinance recommends that it still be dispatched through city dispatch as to whether it's emergency or non-emergency, what happens if a non-emergency ambulance responds to an issue and it turns into a medical emergency? And maybe that's too detailed of a question, but inquiring minds want to know. Oh, ab absolutely, it's a great question. And you, you really hit on it of the ordinance addresses that of they have to notify the communication center, the 911 center, that it has turned into a medical emergency or a 911 Call so that we'll be either concurrently dispatched or dispatched shortly afterward so that we can arrive there on scene and make sure that that, uh, that emergency call that it has escalated to is mitigated appropriately. Thank you for clarifying that. Other council members' questions on this ordinance? 21, ones, I'm sorry, 102. Okay. Moving on then to 21. Madam Mayor. Yes. Oh, before we Council get to the next Mayor one. Brower. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, before we get to the next one. Uh, so I've got a motion to lay over 21103 in its first reading until the next regularly scheduled council meeting. Second. Second. Okay. Motion by Mugerauer, second by uh, Council Member Allison Osby. Uh, discussion on the motion, Councilmember Mugrauer. Thank you for the floor. I appreciate it so I can explain my my reasoning. Um, I've got two reasons, but first, I think it's really bad form that we're taking this up tonight. The county is at the exact same moment as us discussing this issue, um, potentially voting, who knows. Um, but I think it's really bad form that we're we're making the citizens possibly choose between being here and being there to voice their their concerns to both uh, of their elected bodies. So I think it's really bad form that we're doing this. Um, I think it's, whether it's a coincidence or not, I just, I think we should not be doing it tonight. Additionally, uh, number two, um, council gave clear direction several months ago, I believe it was November, council gave very clear direction to the city manager to only bring this back if and when the state or uh, state mandate, the governor's order, was set to be either uh, expiring or repealed legislatively or by Supreme or by the courts. We're not there on either of those. Now, were we there a few weeks ago and there were some, some questions? Possibly yes, but right now we have a valid Governor, Governor Evers order in place and council, now I was in dissent, but council gave very clear direction to only bring back once we had um, a gap, once the governor's order either expired or was legally moot or um, the legislature changed it. So for those two reasons, we should not be taking this up tonight. And that's why I ask that we push it back to the next meeting 
to allow uh, the citizens at the very least to to come to us uh, when the county board is also not discussing it at the same time. I appreciate the floor. Other council members? Council member Peschel? So, uh, so Mr. Mugar, what you're asking is that we move this to the next meeting and allow for two readings to be to begin from that point. Correct? That would be correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Elson Osby. I would um, concur with Mr. Mugerauer. Um, I don't know about the rest of council, but I certainly got feedback from the public uh, that they were not appreciative that um, both the county and the city was covering this on the same night. Um, so I, I would tend to agree. Well, I will just speak for uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Crossy. You go first. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this has been up a couple of times. We've gotten hundreds of emails on what the city, the citizens support or don't support it. So I think we've got plenty of feedback already. Um, if we lay it over this week, next week, or in two weeks, we could always just waive the first reading. So we can. It doesn't really matter if we lay it over because next in two weeks we can just waive the first reading. So it really doesn't. One way or the other. Thank you. And I'll just say that, um, yes, when it was imminent. That, um, there would be potentially a gap. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we, um, had that conversation about whether or not to have a special meeting within 24 hours. Technically, we could have had it within several hours, but to give. Adequate advanced time and it is. An interesting coincidence that they happen to be voting on a, a similar, not the exact same ordinance, but a similar one. And as I understand the way this is proposed, this would only go into effect in the, if it's passed in the absence of county or state. So um, I think it's appropriate. We've had plenty of um, advanced notice. Uh, we've had, you know, numerous emails, phone calls, uh, but that's, that's my stance. Other council members? Council Mayor Ford. You know, I guess just two questions to reference what was just, uh, I guess, in response to uh, the concerns of uh, Council Member Mugerauer. Um, I guess this end up on the agenda on the agenda tonight. Um, you know, how was that decision made by the by the city manager? And um, there's a second question in there. Oh, um, was it on purpose to? Coincide with the county vote. Was that intentional? City manager, you're muted. There you go. No, I didn't. I, I was uh, just moving my cursor over. The uh, no, it was not uh, planned that way. Normally, the county board does not meet on the uh, second Tuesday of the month. Normally, they meet on the odd number. Uh, so uh, uh, when we scheduled this. Uh, I, I was taking a look at uh, the update from the last agenda and, you know, basically because of the provision that the city attorney found that we were able to put an ordinance in place, the way we explained it to council was we don't have to wait and we can put it on the next agenda. And I know there were some thoughts about, you know, putting it on at a special meeting and staff didn't feel that was necessary. And fortunately that proved to be uh, okay because the governor's order is still in effect, but given the flipping back and forth of the legislative and executive branches at the state staff felt it was, you know, it was, it could be, it could be deemed imminently uh, possible, but we didn't schedule it to coincide with the county. Um, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen with the county tonight, but my guess would be that they would uh, defer action. That's my opinion, but uh, I could be wrong. And I'll just say too that we have, um, you know, our public transit requires that by the feds now. Um, we just um, had the library open, and one of their conditions is is masks, and uh, you know the timeliness and the consistencies um, are are relevant here. But certainly uh, appreciate the, you know, the sentiments and the motion being made. We have the motion on the floor. 
if there's no further discussion, we can go ahead and take a vote on the motion to lay over. Paschal. Oh, Council member Paschal first. Point, point of order. Um, yeah, can we yes. just offer a clarification of what of what we're voting on right now? Just so that it's clear. Council member McGrower. Sure. Motion was to lay over the first reading of ordinance. 21103 to the next regularly scheduled meeting. So the first reading would occur at the first meeting in March. That would be when the first reading would would be scheduled. A second would be the uh, subsequent meeting from there. Okay, thank you. So a yes vote would delay it. A no vote is to go ahead and consider the motion or actually there's no action tonight. All right, other questions, comments? All right, please take the roll on the motion. Special? No. Ford? No. Alice Massey? Aye. Crosby? No. Wilbur Aye. Erickson? No. Paul Mary? No. Lost two five. All right, again, there is no action on that ordinance and we will go ahead to discuss 21-103 um, for specifics as to the creation of an ordinance to require face coverings in response to COVID-19 coronavirus emergency. There were a number of emails that were referenced earlier uh, that were recorded into the record and council members have seen the other emails that have come in. Uh, is there further discussion? Council member Ford. Yes, thank you. No, we're not, not voting on this, uh, this tonight, but I did want to just go through some things, um, based on the emails we received. Uh, first off, thanks to everyone who, who reached out. We got a, a ton, uh, especially today. And um, still rifling through them, so my apologies to anyone who hasn't heard back from me yet. You will. Um, I know this is a, a tough issue. Just to summarize some of the uh, the emails we got in opposition, um, a lot of people were just opposed to the idea of a mandate. Um, there's certainly a frustration out there with with the ambiguity around the end of it. Um, as written in our ordinance, it's tied to the uh, in the proposed ordinance. It's tied to our emergency. So I realize that's a little ambiguous. It requires us to take action and people did express that concern. Um, some people just saw it as an attack on their rights. Uh, me personally, you know, I think this is a policy that's more suited to the state. That makes sense. Um, that's why my preference is that we keep, we keep the state mandate in place. My preference would be um, that, th that we don't bring this up until, until our mandate is gone. But I do understand that our state mandate is gone. But I do understand that legal says that we can do this now. Um, so it gives me some pause, but but I get it. Um, I think it's important for the public to understand that if we do pass this in our next meeting, it doesn't go into effect unless the state mandate goes away. Uh, the state's not doing us any favors by having their back and forth their arguments. Um, nobody's happy with that. I think we're the government of last resort here, but someone's got to be. Um, like I said, it's tied to the declared emergency, so that is important, so it's not totally arbitrary. A um, couple of things floating around in terms of misinformation, I think maybe some confusion with the county ordinance too, but this will not apply as written to any type of private residences. Um, and there's all kinds of exemptions in there, and I think that's important for people, whether they're against the uh, ordinance or for the ordinance, to understand and really share. Um, exemptions including for medical conditions, and for things as simple as people having trouble breathing, wearing a mask. And, and I bring that up, one, to reassure people that do have medical conditions that are concerned about, about an ordinance like this. But then also to, 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 I guess, make sure that people aren't shaming people that they see not wearing a mask or taking it upon themselves to, to publicly call out when they see someone not wearing a mask. Because let you know they're actually breaking the ordinance. And, and you can't know that unless you're talking to them or if you if I would know how you would know that you're their doctor. I don't know, uh, but you can't be shaming people. That doesn't help anybody um, th that doesn't get us to the ultimate end goal, which is to, to 
get through what I hope is the final lap of this, <laughs> this scourge on our, uh, on not just on our health, but on our whole public dynamic here. I mean, this has gotten ugly. Um, so that's really all I got to say about this and uh, look forward to, to voting on it in two weeks. Thank you. Other council members? Council Member Allison Asby, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess, you know, a couple of comments and, and to Mr. Ford's point, you know, that certainly has been an issue, which has been part of the problem, you know, with having a mandate. Um, and I know, um, at least I've heard that, um, at least in the beginning when this came out, that there was a number of calls that were flooding the health department that were more about um, telling on the numbers, um, regardless of what the situation was going on. But, you know, a couple things to point out, and I think where some of the frustration is coming is, what exactly are the metrics? Um, so when you look at the graph that the county has put out, we're, we're at a significant lower amount of cases per day and hospitalizations but yet this is something that keeps coming up and and i i get the fact that we don't know what we don't know um but still again it's frustrating to the public so you can put days on it but what is the goal and and i just listened to um, a podcast that even governor evers uh commented on in which you know this is not going to be something that's ever going to go away it's not that we're ever going to not have deaths so what are the expectations? And I guess the other thing that I'd like to note, because when I read um, the ordinance, you know, again, there, there's there's absolutely no teeth in it. And we're putting we're we're putting this policy in or this ordinance in place really to make people feel good. And I get where that's important, but at the same time, it doesn't do much either. Like for example, one of the paragraphs is you know that any person who fails to comply with the ordinance may be asked to leave by any property owner business organization or entity persons refusing to leave when asked may be subject to citation for trespass or other applicable law or regulations based on their conduct that's nothing new folks um any private business currently or residents that has somebody who's not complying with the rules or the expectations of that business already can call OPD and they come and take care of it. So, you know, I don't want people to think that this is this is anything but essentially something token. Um, there is no meat on it. We we have no health department um, for anybody to call on. And so I think that was, if I was to guess, I'm assuming part of the reason why Mr. Mugerauer had suggested holding over, and I agree, is not just that it's on the same, but at the end of the day, the county's going to have far more enforcement than the city. And being that we have all the townships, are all the townships going to apply that are, are directly closely related to us? You can go to, if you go to Festival Foods, you have to wear a mask, but hop across the highway in the town of Algoma and you don't. So when we talk about like taking away the level of confusion, I think we're also adding to it. And we have no jurisdiction over some of the biggest entities, school district, university, Fox Valley Tech, um, and am I missing anyone else? So um, just a thought, but, you know, um, Mr. Mover and I have brought up points before, and, and I think Mr. Ford has as well, but it's been clear that um, the majority of council does not want to engage in any conversation that has any type of um, compromise on this. So I guess we'll see where it's at in two weeks. Other council members? Council member Mugerauer and um, and then Ford. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had I was conflicted whether I was going to bring this up this meeting or next, but I'll I'll bring it up now so there's there's time to at least have staff discuss it and and council can mull it. But having this tied to our city state of emergency is a really bad idea um, because there's an absolute scenario where the public health emergency and the public health uh, we'll use the pandemic, the, the, uh, the pandemic's over or the pandemic, uh, we don't no longer need it. However, we will have our state of emergency extended. We regularly do that administratively for certain reasons, uh, accounting and other reasons. So uh, having this tied to that is actually a really bad idea. There needs to be an end date. And I, I absolutely believe that it should be short 
uh, 60 to 90 days, and then council should have to reaffirm those decisions, just like the governor has to every 60 days because his order only lasts 60 days, unless it's affirmed by the, the legislative body that, that checks and balances him. So I believe council should have an end date on this. Um, we should have that discussion regularly because uh, even though it's uncomfortable for many of you to have large amounts of people uh, telling you that they feel you're wrong, uh, it's your role and our role to listen to them um, and to hear those concerns. So I think an end date, um, a hard date in there is absolutely required. So when it does come up in two weeks, I'll be asking for that. Madam Mayor? Yes, it may, be, it may be appropriate for the city attorney to uh, to kind of explain that uh, Councilmember Mugar raised a valid point, but I think that's uh, I think the city attorney was anticipating some uh, direction from council on that, whether it happens today or uh, in the future uh, a subsequent meeting. Uh, we can do either or. But there might be some confusion or like 1 of the prior drafts was tied to the end date of the end of the emergency. This 1. As a blank in it, um, if you look at it, it, we are anticipating we we do need a date from you as to, you know, when when it would terminate. So um, we did On not. Page 173, uh, it says until blank, or until termination of the state emergency, whichever is earlier. Yeah. So we so would what, have a inserted. Page, what page is that on? Page 173. Getting there. Also in the publication requirement, it's referenced in, in the uh, explanation in the public edu uh, public um, notification at the end of the ordinance as well. But yeah, we are we are looking for a date from you. Well, it seems to me that we could also change that language to say uh, review um, that it shall uh, remain in effect until such time that council reviews it. So couldn't we go into a discussion of um, we will review this in 60 days or um, at such time that either the county or the um, the state uh, or uh, the state emergency order is over. I think you're saying basically the same thing it's saying. If you would put in that date and it, it, if you read it, it says, whichever is earlier, unless extended or earlier terminated or modified by council. So even if you put an end date 60 days out, that's basically telling you at 60 days out, it's either terminating or you can review and extend it if you'd like. So I, I think we're both, I think you're saying essentially the same thing it does say. Council member Ford, sorry, I skipped over you. Oh, that, no, that's okay. Um, just in response to council member, um, Mooger hour, you know, I'm the, I'm the lead teacher in the academy for my 2 little kids. So, like, I'm very used to being told very loudly that I'm wrong on a daily basis. So I'm absolutely happy. Uh, to revisit this, if we revisit every 60 days, that'd be a lot. That'd be very relaxing, actually. Um, but, but no, in all seriousness, what I was going to ask you, but you, you you got ahead of me. You were thinking the same thing. Um, if you would be comfortable, if people would be comfortable putting it like 60 to 90 days on it, I think there's a logic to that, especially in light of what you said about the um, about the emergency issue, and, I, and that that's a very good point. Um, I, I would, in response to the mayor's comments, I think it makes sense for us. Obviously, legal has to make sure that, that this is this is doable. Um, but to have specific language in there that doesn't just give us the option to review it, but I really do think it's important that it it either is affirmed by us or goes away. So at the very least, that creates the ability for the public to come in, weigh on it. It gives us the ability to weigh on current conditions, um, and I guess forces us forces us to act on this um, regularly. I think that's that's reasonable. But I know we can hash that out at our next meeting. But I'm I'm fine with that. I guess I'd also kind of like to hear from uh, perhaps Chief Stanley, um, or uh, I don't want to put Councilmember Erickson on the spot, but um, you know, would we have a better chance of having higher rates of vaccination sixty days out or ninety days out? Um, because we also have to consider you know some other things uh, before. 
and I think it's a really fair question that council members Allison Asby and Mukrauer bring up, you know, at what point can we start to see the end, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel here? Um, would, would Chief Stanley like to comment on, on the uh, timing and what we can hopefully expect in 60 to 90 days, or if there's a different a differentiation there? Yeah, I think absolutely there is that, you know, we're starting to really make some progress. We had our uh, call with uh, public health director Garen earlier this morning, you know, we're, we're starting to get more and more vaccine out, but I mean, we're still just putting our toe in the water of the category twos, you know, that you know, we're still hundreds and thousands of people to, to vaccinate in this area in this state in the country so i mean 90 days you know hopefully we'll have a much better idea 60 days is a little a little soon but you know some of the accounts and like i said nobody knows definitively but some are even saying into this fall so you know until we have a a better fulfillment and supply chain you know, resolution you know because the infrastructure is there you know when we have vaccines across the country, you know, and here locally, we're giving the vaccines, they're getting out, but having that steady supply, you know, to meet the demands is, is really the issue. So I think 60 days might be a, be too soon for my comfort level, you know, and I would assume for the, the health departments, you know, I think 90 days would be a better benchmark to look at where are we really at as far as wide scale vaccinations. Thank you, Chief. Council Member Erickson and then Deputy Mayor Krause. I'll just add that um, I'd be comfortable um, tying this to, I think, either 60 or 90. I think I'd feel more comfortable with 90 given our our timeline, but um, I think that keeps us keeps us accountable and allows us to have this discussion to either affirm it or, or vote against it. So I, I'm comfortable with that. Deputy Mayor Krause. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the way I understand it is after the state would expire or get turned down, we'd start our 60 day window. So, I mean, after 60 days, we can revisit it again. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make that it expires at 60 days just we revisit it again and it won't be taken down until after that would be discussed anyway so i don't see a problem with 60 days and i mean two-thirds of the country has mask mandates by the states and the other 13 are all republican-led houses so science says to have a mask mandate right now so i don't even know why it's up for discussion why we'd want to take it down or why we why we wouldn't want one after a state would get shot down so the 60 days I'm okay with. City attorney, do you, do you want us to um, clarify this anymore or does that give you what you need? And the mayor, I would suggest that at the next meeting, there'll be a motion to amend the ordinance to fill in a, a fill in that blank. There's 60 or 90 that's been discussed. I would suggest to council mull it over and uh, be prepared to offer up at least at least one amendment for your consideration. Uh, but that's the idea is to change this section specifically. Uh, yeah, and I would do I would agree to do it by a formal motion. All right, thank you. All right, so we now, let me just get back into the agenda here. And we are now at new resolutions, resolution 21-104, approved purchase of four refuse trucks from McNeilis Truck and Manufacturing Inc., a division of Oshkosh Corporation, for the sanitation division of the Department of Public Works, $1,022,080. We'll need a motion and a second. So moved. Mugrauer and Council Member Peschel, second. All right. Discussion. Council Member Mugrauer. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, my comments will be brief, but I just want to thank um, Public Works and Purchasing for going through this process. Um, Oshkosh Corp's a great, uh, a great partner. We've been uh, partners with them, you know, obviously exclusively with, with our fire trucks. They're a great community partner, uh, and I, for one, very excited to see a few more Oshkosh Corporation uh, built vehicles. Uh, driving down our roads, these will be made right here in the USA. Um, this being able to be serviced uh, quite locally is a big plus for us, and it's a great partnership to develop on on that side of the public works um, uh, side of Oshkosh. So very excited! I'm I'm glad it's happening, and um, uh, I'm glad we were able to get this uh, get this done. So thank you very much. Further discussion on twenty one one oh four. All right, let's take the roll. Special. Aye. Ford. Aye. Allison Aspey. Aye. Rosie. Present. Uber Aye. Aye. Erickson. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. Carry six one present. All right. Next uh, new resolution twenty one dash one oh five approved conditional use permit. For a temporary use permit extension at 2728 Oregon Street, Plan Commission recommends approval. I'll need a motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. Paschal and Erickson, thank you. Discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Paschal? Aye. Ford? Aye. Allison Askew. Aye. Kelsey. Aye. Ubrower. Aye. Erickson. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. Period seven. All right. Next, we have a pending resolution twenty one one zero six. Approve the revised investment policy. Can I have a motion and a second on that, please? So moved. Second. Ford and Mugerauer. Thank you. Discussion. All right, Councilmember Ford. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I know this had a little bit of a uh, of a winding road uh, road to get here, and I'm just glad that we uh, we're getting this we're getting this passed. And I want to commend um, Russ's work in, in getting this together um, for us. I think this puts us on a, uh, a sound footing in terms of our investment strategy moving forward. So thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, please take the roll. Paschal? Aye. Ward? Aye. Allison Aspey? Aye. Carlsey? Aye. Google Aye. Erickson? Aye. Mary. Aye. Carried seven. All right, next we have the council discussion and direction to city manager and future agenda items. Future agenda items. Council members. All right, future workshops. Looks like we have a meeting with local legislators scheduled for March 11th at 4 p.m. via WebEx. Councilmember Mugerauer. Sorry about that. I was clicking mute and, or unmute and, and didn't get there fast enough. For um, a brief council discussion, I think this is where it should fall. Um, I'd like, I guess, an explanation from, from the city manager in terms of uh, why we're not meeting in person, uh, or at least an update in terms of why council is not. Um, you know, for example, the school board is meeting in a room half this size that I'm sitting in right now, and uh, they're meeting in person. Um, I got no issues with boards and commissions uh, still meeting virtually. I think it's, um, I think that's probably best. Um, but I think the seven of us in this room is is a vitally important thing, and I'd like to know why we're not, or um, to have an answer for that, or to hear council's other thoughts in terms of if we should be or not. For a future agenda item, Councilmember Mugerauer. Um, if, if city manager wants to address it now, or I can, I can restate the statement back under, uh, outstanding issues too, I guess. Um, 
but I'd like an answer tonight in terms of when, when, and why we're not why we're not meeting uh, in person right now. I'd be happy to answer if uh, if the council would like me to. The um, and I probably put Chief Stanley on the spot a little bit as well. And um, uh, County Health Director Guerin obviously isn't here this evening, but uh, I had numerous discussions with both. Uh, Health Director Guerin, as well as Chief Stanley, in terms of uh, where we were relative to numbers, they have improved uh, quite a bit the last couple of weeks. Um, but you know, the short answer is that we're close to making some real progress with vaccinations, and let's maintain that uh, at least for the next two months. Um, I can't answer why the school district is is. Uh, now conducting their meetings in person, they they went virtual before we did, uh, and and we've st stayed with it. Uh, I can say for the most part, we've worked out the technical bugs. Um, I think there are still issues with citizen participation, which is you know always going to be the issue. Uh, we always want to be more accessible to the public, um, but the idea behind it was, even though the uh, I, I would agree with council member Mugerauer that the school board's area is smaller than even ours. Ours is still relatively small for the number of people that we have, you know, at the DS itself, that's 11 people. And, you know, we were fairly crowded initially. I know there was some concern from some members of the council and the and staff that were out in the audience a little more very close to the public podium. Uh, as you know, some members of the public at that time chose not to mask up, and there were some concerns about that. Um, that's that's really the logic behind it. Um, I made the decision to take it out through April because um, the uncertainty of where the numbers were going at the time. Uh, they are improving, certainly, but we also um, we want to make sure that we've given ourselves enough time for vaccines to begin to get into the, the general population. So um, I don't know if any other council members have that because have any other comments. Many of you have spoken to me about it, wanted to have it. Um, it is uh, based on the ordinance, uh, my responsibility to make that call. And But I, I don't take that responsibility lightly. I, I welcome the input and council member Mugerauer and I have had discussions about this and he, you know, he certainly wants to have it open, um, and I would love to get it back open too. I just don't know if we're there yet. And Chief Stanley, I'm not sure, you know, if you want to chime in because, you know, I've certainly valued your counsel on this as well. Yeah, I can certainly understand the the concerns about live meetings and effective effective government processes, and you know, it's a struggle for everybody, and you know. Councilmember Ford talked about, you know, he's running the E Academy at his house for his kids. You know, I know many of you are in that situation, and so many people in our communities are. You know, that's as we've we've said all along, we want to get ahead of this and stay ahead of this. You know, and I think we have done incredibly well as a community. We've been very fortunate. You know, we've uh, had people that have had losses, and you know, certainly you know, lots of ill effects of of the COVID virus. But, you know, my concern, our concern is how do we keep people safe? You know, and how do we protect our city employees? How do we protect our elected officials? You know, how do we uh, reduce risk of disease transmission? You know, and that's something that's, we're going to, we're still learning a lot about, you know, as a country. If, will the vaccines protect us? You know, how do masks work? All of those things. But, you know, we really have to evaluate risk versus benefits. You know, in the emergency management context of what can we do to, to minimize risk? You know, city manager Roloff alluded to, we've had people that uh, don't comply with the social distancing, that uh, don't want to comply with the mask ordinance. You know, as we've explored earlier, there's still a lot of uh, angst in the community about compliance with a mask ordinance and is it an infringement of rights? And, you know, so. Do I dream of a, a day when we're all back to normal and we sit in the same room and, you know, 
go about our daily business not wearing masks? Absolutely. I think everybody does. But, you know, is there a demonstrated risk of putting 50 people in that room or 20 people in that room and some of them are not going to wear masks and they're going to be in there for greater than 15 minutes? Absolutely there is. You know, so uh, I agree with City Manager Roloff. This isn't something we evaluate lightly, uh, but it's something we take very seriously and, you know, and we we revisit frequently as a topic. Councilmember Ford. Yeah, uh, thank you very much to both of you for that for that explanation. Um, just something you said there, Chief Stanley, got to me about how well we've done um, a, as a community. And just look at how far we've come since since those times we were number one in that New York Times list. And that's a testament to you know to all of our residents willing to do the right thing, not because of compliance, but because because they want to do the right thing. Um, and I do, I mean, I, I do, Councilman Mugerauer. I want us to be in person as soon as possible. Um, so I, I'll gladly share that share that testament. And I do appreciate the uh, the explanations from the city manager and Chief Stanley. So thank you. Other council members, questions. Yes, I actually look forward to seeing you guys in person again very soon. I think we're really close and, um, you know, we're just, we're not quite there yet. Let's just hang on a little bit longer and we'll all be able to um, reconvene hopefully very soon. All right, so the next item then is the meeting with the local legislators, uh, March, March 11th at 4 p.m. via WebEx. Um, looks like there is a draft um, list or wish list of discussion items. We have two hours scheduled. So um, thank you to council members McGrower and Ford for putting forth your, your wish list of topics and uh, do other council members, if you have some specific items that you would like to um, try and cover, we'll have to fight over the priority. Uh, but get those to City Manager Roloff. Um, what's the latest date, City Manager? Well, fortunately, the council's next meeting is two days before the meeting with the legislators. As a courtesy to them, I would like to let them know what the list is. So if you could get it to me next week by, say, Wednesday, so that would be the 3rd of March, then I could have a list on there. But council may need to pare it down, as the mayor correctly pointed out. It's only a two hour meeting and I put it into categories on page 219 and obviously the state budget is going to be a big issue. There are other things I, you know, maybe some of the council members want to explain what they were thinking with some of the items, but certainly there's, there's a lot of stuff on that list and, and you could get into subtopics as well. Um, obviously with some of the direction that the council's given me as far as goals, um, having municipal services makes a lot of sense to have on the agenda. Um, certainly homelessness, uh, because that's not just a city issue. It, it has other issues, but there's a lot of things in there that you may want to talk about. Um, and you know, maybe it's just getting a briefing or an update from the legislators, but there's a lot of stuff there. And I'm worried that you might get, um, two hours might uh, come and go very quickly. And, uh, I think we need to prioritize the list. And and certainly council members are also welcome to contact legislature legislators um, on their own as well. Um, I know one of the things that occurred to me this morning as I was attending the West Side um, Business Association's developers panel, um, there was a, a presentation regarding um, an assisted, a very substantial, a large assisted living um, senior uh, complex on the west side of the city that's being built. And one of the questions you know, that came to my mind was, um, how are they going to staff with caregivers? And uh, I believe there was a, a couple of items in the uh, proposed budget by Governor Evers that related to, um, you know, caregiving in, in the elderly communities. So, you know, as we see more and more of that need, um, you know, perhaps that's something that we, we also may want to address because um, they'll probably be fighting over, 
you know, which facility is going to get what caregivers uh, unless something is done soon. There's been a shortage for quite a while, but in any event, um, you're all welcome to uh, submit your wish list. And like I said, we'll have to maybe arm wrestle for who gets to talk about what. Um, but thanks for setting that up. And then I just have um, a quick comment on um, special event. It was brought to my attention this weekend by a number of phone calls, a couple of messages, um, some angry folks um, saying, why did the council um, pass a permit or allow a permit to be issued for a special event? And a lot of um, allegations were put out there in, in terms of maybe some response to social media photos or videos in that. Um, and, and the media also indicated that thousands were participating on Battle on Bagel, but um, I, I do want to point out that thousands may have been participating, but it was across the entire lake, uh, not thousands in the after party tent. Um, but the question I think is really relevant that we ask if we do issue a special event permit that those organizers, you know, follow through what they agreed to do. And I don't know if staff can, you know, speak to it tonight because it's rather quickly after the event as to whether or not, you know, that happened or not. I did have a really good discussion with the, um, um, President of their board, uh, Mr. Curran, and it, it appears that they were below uh, the capacity of that tent uh, based on his representation. But the um, there was a generator failure that had to do with their air exchange and their heat and so on and so forth. Not to um, say that we shouldn't have this conversation at a greater level uh, regarding our special events because some of these perceptions that um, folks don't want to, you know, mask or distance and, and that can cause problems for other events or future events. And we're, again, we're almost there folks. We, you know, we need to just be a little patient, but I just want to assure folks who reached out, the numerous folks who reached out over the weekend that uh, there were requirements in place and uh, could staff perhaps speak to that this evening? Ray, do you think you want to start, please? Sure, I will. Sure. I'm just making sure I'm unmuted and back on video. So, um, yes, we had um, some conversations with um, Mayor Paul Mary and a few other individuals after some of the video or the social media posts were made and we took a look at the um, guidelines or the suggestions that battle and bagel put forth when it came to the common council for approval um, back in january and we as we looked at those we felt that they complied with what they had um, in their list they actually from what we understand took some extra steps above and beyond what they provided to us, they um, they provided for some additional weigh-in stations out in Winnicani at a, an establishment out there to keep less people coming into Oshkosh and Menominee Park. Um, from my understanding, and Kathy Snell is still on the call, I believe, so she can jump in too, but I believe Kathy had a conversation with um, Ann Boyce, the sanitary, sanitarian from the health department, and when she made her inspection on uh, Friday evening, early Friday evening, my understanding is that everything was in compliance, uh, possibly except for um, a, a pizza vendor possibly that came out there that didn't have their proper licensing. And I believe um, they worked through that to get the proper licensing in place. Um, so as far as what they provided us and um, what they did, my understanding is they, they complied with that. As far as the, um, the capacity, when we met originally with Battle on Bago and Otter Street, um, they informed us based on their, it's, it's a large tent. It's one of the largest tents that you'll see for a, a special event um, in this area. And they've had crowds upwards of four to 5,000 people within that tent in the past. Um, so as we met with them and discussed the 25% capacity, they were in agreement with that and said, we will um, accept that and, and work with that. Um, 
our estimation from what we understand from some of the police staff on site, they estimated that there were approximately 1,000 to 1,500 people um, at the given time, at the busy time, but there's people coming and going. So that was their estimation that they provided to us. Kathy, you have anything else that you might want to share as well? I think that you've covered them. Well, thanks for that update, Ray. Do other council members have any comments or concerns? I don't know which of you got the same phone calls or messages that I did. Council member Mukerauer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. No, I had some uh, good conversations with uh, different city staff members as well as uh, members of the Battle on Bago uh, organization. Um, I want to thank city staff for working with them and and going through that process, you know, at the end of 2020 and, and bringing that to us for approvals along with several other, you know, potentially large events or, or just, you know, events that are going to uh, hopefully occur here in 2021. Battle on Bago is a great, a great partner in this community. They do a lot. Does that give anyone, uh, just because someone does good work, does it give anyone carte blanche to do anything they want? No, of course not. Um, I, I want to reassure the people at home that, you know, our staff is making sure that, um, you know, requests are reasonable, they're in compliance, and this is exactly what, you know, Battle on Bago did everything that we asked of them and more, they even volunteered more to try to have a successful event. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate uh, we live in the, the social media world of, of lots of shaming. We talked about it a little bit earlier. I wish there was a lot less of that in terms of of, uh, of the society we live in, but that's the reactionary keyboard warrior state that we live in that, that we hit social media when, when we don't see something that one individual doesn't like. Um, I'm thankful that, that uh, we had a successful event. We're gonna learn from it. It'll be a case study for, you know, for the next couple, um, larger events that probably want to come here and, and ask a lot of questions. And um, I know Battle and Bago has uh, expressed some uh, more than willingness to, to meet with staff and talk about it. Let's debrief, learn from it and, um, you know, what went right? What what do we need to improve upon? What can others learn from this? And so I'm, I'm appreciative of their willingness to do that. They're they're a good partner with us and, and I'm thankful for that. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we'll just move into reports by council liaison for boards and commissions. Uh, the only one I have to report on right now is uh, diversity, equity and inclusion committee met uh, Monday night and uh, they um, have established that they have an interest in pursuing uh, working with the. Um, is it FBI? I think city manager. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Yes, I see the nod. Yes, yes. 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 FBI. Um, has they have an interest in exploring working with them uh, to facilitate uh, getting into the the final stages of uh, their action planning uh, that that was expected. You know, at the end of uh, one year with our city ordinance, and they are wrapping up the um, their final version of the mission statement along with uh, exploration. And there's been a number of uh, presentations that um, came forth and I want to thank council member um, Erickson uh, for presenting uh, the other evening in her capacity uh, with the community health strategist um, that that was a very good conversation. And I think that um, the fact that we have this committee, um, they're, they're very interested and they're very helpful in uh, being trusted people in, in the community. Uh, amongst a variety of groups and, and can help spread the word and uh, not spread COVID, but getting out the, the vaccine word and having those trusted relationships is really important. So they're certainly starting to show a lot of contribution and, and meaning in uh, that formation of that committee. Other council member reports on boards and committees. All right, seeing none, cooperative, uh, I'm sorry, city manager announcements and statements. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A few items in your agenda packet uh, just draw to your attention. The uh, turnout gear for the fire department, that's a, uh, uh, a cooperative purchase that uh, the fire department's done for a budgeted item. 
Uh, certainly happy to answer any questions you may have about that. But uh, Chief Stanley is sticking around, not for that. But uh, you may have read this on Facebook today, but I'm going to toss it to Chief Stanley to uh, to make a very uh, uh, great announcement. So, Chief, if you could take it away with the news. All that lead in any mutes. <laughs> Come on, Mike. Bu Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take away your thunder. Chief Stanley. Okay, he's not here. He isn't. He hasn't put on video yet. Um, we were just notified by um, the insurance rating agency ISO that the city is one of the very few fire departments in the entire country that has achieved an ISO rating of one, which is the absolute highest rating you can get for a fire department. Um, I know that Chief Stanley and my discussions with him um, wanted to thank the uh, Public Works Department, uh, in particular, um, Public Works Director Robbie uh, and the water distribution staff, because water availability and reliability is a huge part of that. And now that I'm saying all these nice things, Steve Chief Stanley has now uh, put himself present. So, all right, he's got oh, he's got his shiny badge on too. So, okay, Chief, go ahead and uh, take your take your bow and be sure to share that love with Public Works. You there, Mike? He's still, he's, he's stone silent because of all the news. But th this puts us in the 99th percentile of all fire departments in the country. Uh, that is outstanding. Um, and it does demonstrate uh, the commitment to training that our fire department has. Uh, it, and it also demonstrates the collaboration that our fire and public works departments have to make sure that we have a reliable water supply uh, so when you hear us talk about getting the water towers done and, and getting the right size mains and getting loops of, of water mains, it, it is not just about us getting a glass of water. It's also about having that fire uh, suppression uh, capability. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of the department. They put a lot of work into uh, to making that information available and, uh, and you, you you may have read about it on Facebook. We're certainly going to talk about it more, but I wanted to 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 do this publicly and and uh, and thank uh, Chief and his staff and Public Works Director Robbie and his and his staff as well. Congratulations, congratulations, Chief Stanley. I, I know it looks like you're still having some tech issues. I think, um, but roll off maybe if, if City Manager roll off if you want to uh, maybe chime in on this one and and I think I won't speak for council but I extend my congratulations it's an awesome thing um you know when, when you're recognized among your peers that you get to, that you stand out that's fantastic and the collaboration is awesome as well um is there anything that the 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 taxpayers or the property owners in the city of Oshash can uh, expect to see because of that possibly I'll lead it in for you thank you for tossing the softball to me thank you uh Yes, it does. That ISO rating is something that is a component of your uh, house insurance, your, uh, specifically fire, the fire aspect of your insurance. So um, uh, make sure you uh, let your insurance agents know, but most of them keep an eye on that. Um, and that will have a, an impact on the fire insurance aspect of your, your home insurance, or if you rent, it'll certainly help keep those costs down as well. Um, and yeah, there's a direct benefit uh, to us. So uh, I'll, I'll just keep moving along. We have the 9th Avenue reconstruction uh, water services review by Brown and Caldwell that we have in our package. Um, our donation policy requires that we provide you a donation report on an annual basis. Uh, Finance Director Van Gompel has included that in the agenda packet for the council to review. And this just any uh, donations, a hundred dollars or more, uh, we we report on those things. So uh, happy for that. Um, the council photo is scheduled for March fourth. I think Diane is going to be contacting you about scheduling you a socially distant time to get everybody together, uh, and the magic of Photoshop will take care of the rest. Uh, have so have the outstanding issues 
in the agenda packet and happy to answer any questions you may have about that. Otherwise, that's all I have, Madam Mayor. Well, it looks like um, there's quite the competition going on. If you look at that donation list between police, fire, parks, and the senior center. <laughs> well, there's a lot of love in town. I mean, that, I think that's a reflection of the public's faith and belief in the different departments and the different missions they serve, as well as the generosity of our uh, our public. I mean, some of these are just regular private citizens, others are organizations and stuff like that, but that is pretty, uh, thank you for, for noticing that, uh, Madam Mayor, because I think it does demonstrate that there's a lot of support in our community. Um, if I could just ask one question about that on the list there, um, crisis intervention donations, uh, where does that, where does that fall in our city departments? Those are police departments and I don't see, uh, I don't see chief Smith here, but those are, uh, that's our crisis intervention team. So, uh, those are donations that we get from them, uh, and they're small. Um, sometimes it's somebody who, who experienced some really good, uh, you know, had a really good experience with our officers and, uh, wanted to show their, um, support for continuing work that they do in that regard. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. It looks like while um, police might have fire beat and parks beat, if you include that along with the Santa program, or oh, wait, is the Santa program split up between fire and police? I don't know that level of detail, but now, thank you, Madam Mayor. You've just given a lot of trash talking for my staff meeting tomorrow. They're going to be going <laughs> at each other. Thank you so much. But thank you. Yeah, thanks to the community um, for all those donations. Um, that's um, really, really uh, very touching. Very touching. Thank you for noticing. That's all I have, Madam Mayor. All right, folks, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Go move. Second. All right, Mugrower and Asby, I don't think there's probably much discussion about that. Please take the roll. Satchel? Aye. Ford? Aye. Allison Asby? Aye. Rousey? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Aye. Erickson? Aye. Palmieri? Aye. Carried seven. They are adjourned. And Chief Stanley sends his regards for having a frozen screen. So, uh, wave chief. He can't even see us. So, he can't. Good, evening, he can't. Everybody. Yep. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.